Premier, thank you for your time. Good to be here. Uh, a lot of talk this week about your appearance in Ontario fundraiser at the Royal York Hotel. You said you don't think it's a big deal, but it seems incongruous for a premier whose bill won out of the gates was to ban union and corporate donations. Doesn't this fly in the face of the tone you set right out of the gates? Well, you know, I think what you have to do is keep an eye, first of all, on what the objective of the legislation is and then the particular facts of this case. So in the case of, of, of banning uh, and li corporate union donations and ultimately, I hope, limiting the amount that can be donated, it's really about ensuring that uh, a particularly wealthy donor is not able to uh, benefit a particular politician by making a donation to them and then somehow as a result get something that they want in government. So it's a sort of a circular relationship. That of course doesn't exist in this case because uh, I received no benefit from, from uh, being uh, Ms. Horvath's guest. Um, in addition, it was very much uh, in accordance with our conflict of interest and, and our Elections Act as we amended. When you look at the fact that corporate donations are allowed in Ontario, I think it's probably fair to say, I mean, I don't know exactly what the Ontario NDP's position is, but they probably would try to ban corporate and union donations were they to, uh, to uh, be elected. But in the meantime, they are a political party operating in a province that allows this kind of fundraising that occurs um, with, um, with uh, people of all in all different partisan groups. And so as a result, they need to uh, do what they can in order to be able to compete on an equal footing. And I support that. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, asked for money from unions back in the day before we brought in that legislation because we needed to try and and compete on equal footing. And then when you become, uh, when you find yourself in a position where you can change the rules, then you do if, if that's really important to you. But in the meantime, our democracy is such that it's not helpful to cut off your nose and then go into uh, an election uh, uh, contest with your hands tied behind your back. Because if you do, you will not ever uh, manage to uh, to get into the position to make the rules more fair. It's just I just I feel like I can almost hear mm -hmm. Rachel Notley in opposition just having a field day with with Jim Prentice or Allison Redford attending a ten thousand dollar a plate dinner uh, with businesses that do business in Alberta. But to be clear, they never even then I I would have looked at it and I said, well, are they getting any benefit? Well, no, I think this is actually a tempest in a teapot because they're not getting any benefit from it. So how does it provide a benefit to the business? So uh, the fact of the matter is, is that any of those people uh, that were at that dinner could come to Alberta and meet with me the way people here can meet with me. Uh, as people have reported, we're having a fundraiser tonight, $250 a ticket. People are allowed to come to that. I also walk down the street in my riding on the weekends. People can talk to me there, and they often do. Often people contact my office and ask for meetings. And no, I don't get to say yes to every meeting, but I do meet with people uh, quite consistently in my role as Premier. So uh, it's not necessary for somebody to do that. So it's, 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 it's that, that issue there is not, uh, they're not connected in that the you know uh, donation A does not get outcome B because we're not getting any benefit from it in accordance with the legislation. Does the unique structure of, of the NDP in Canada in that one membership buys you essentially a provincial and federal membership, does that connection and the fact that you have to talk about sections of the party, does it make it your job more complicated? No, I don't think so, not at all really, because it's not that different than, than most other parties. And, and to be clear, legally, uh, the Ontario NDP uh, and, and the federal NDP neither can donate uh, to uh, the Alberta NDP. That's a function of our election law. So there's, there's no uh, financial relationship there at all. You announced this week a by-election in the riding of Calgary Greenway, of, of, of course, with the passing of Manmi Bular, that's become a necessity. How much will you, as Premier, read into the results of that by-election, whatever they may be? Well, I think by-elections are uh, a difficult uh, predictor, you know, I mean, if you were to look at uh, the four by-elections that we had in the um, fall of 2014, I believe uh, the Conservatives won all four of them. And, uh, and then just a few, a few months later, uh, they really didn't. So, uh, you know, by-elections by are a moment in time. I think that, you know, uh, Manmeet Bular was a, a hard-working representative in that, in that riding, and, and I think a lot of people will be uh, thinking about his, his memory. And, and we've, uh, our members in that riding have nominated a, an excellent candidate, and she's gonna go out and talk to people about why she uh, would be able to be a good uh, MLA, and, and you know, we'll see where the chips fall. 
Angus Reid has conducted several polls over the last several months in junior approval rating, above 50%, about 53 uh, in, in uh, December, plummeted to 45, February 33%. How much does a premier read into approval ratings while in office? Well, I mean, you got to keep an eye out if, if, it's, if, if things are getting completely out of control and, if, and whether there's an issue with a particular policy or something, because I think it's always important for, uh, for um, uh, political leaders to, to be responsive to the public. And I suppose pol uh, public opinion polls are part of that. But honestly, they are also impacted by a number of things. We are in the most tumultuous and difficult economic uh, position that Alberta has been in, in at least a generation, if not two or three. Uh, and so often, as, as I just outlined, I mean, if you were to look six months before the last election, our party uh, had something like 12 or 13 percent. And uh, so the fact of the matter is, is polls change very quickly. Uh, and so my goal as Premier is to do what I can to support Albertans through these very, very difficult times and to create a record uh, that I can be proud of so that when it comes to that election time, when we get a little bit more tuned into what the polls are saying, um, uh, I have a record to run on that I'm proud of, that I think uh, connects with uh, a significant number of Albertans. Your colleague in Saskatchewan, Brad Wall, his approval rating sitting right around 62% right now, close to double yours. Do you read into that at all? And do you think it might have anything to do with styles of leadership, specifically out, how outspoken and even aggressive he's been in promoting the energy industry? Uh, you know, I feel that I've actually been doing a lot of work promoting the energy industry myself. I was very pleased to uh, go out to Toronto and to speak to people there about uh, our climate leadership plan and also the importance of getting uh, a pipeline built, uh, not only to Albertans but to all Canadians who uh, rely on the prosperity that is generated out of Alberta. So I actually think that uh, I've been doing a lot of, of uh, work across the country, talking to people that, that might otherwise be uh, somewhat uh, resistant to the need for pipeline infrastructure, talking to them in a respectful way way about the issues they're concerned about and making the case on the merits for the pipeline infrastructure that we need. And so I think that that's the way to go. Now, when I'm doing that, I'm not playing to my base at home. I'm actually trying to get the outcome uh, that we need back here at home and quite frankly across the country. And so that's my focus right now is the outcomes. It's not about uh, playing for the folks back home. And uh, you know, if we get the outcome, I, I, I hope that it will also help back here but at this point my focus is on trying to get the best results for Albertans. How much of your political success is tied to the success of the Energy East pipeline? Um, you know I, I, I uh, don't know entirely I think certainly um, all politicians political success uh, will ultimately be I think the Prime Ministers will be and I frankly think that all Premiers are going to have to to take some responsibility for it ultimately because I think that as a um, energy producing nation, uh, even as we are, the world is moving uh, to a less uh, carbon intensive economy and moving away from non-renewable energy, the fact of the matter is, is that move is not going to happen overnight. And we are a progressive energy producer. And so we should be able to do that in a smarter way possible. And if we're not successful, all of us at making that happen, it's going to undermine uh, the economic success of our country and I think ultimately that all of us who are in leadership positions across the country uh, may well pay a price. Were you paying any attention to the goings-on in a Walmart parking lot down in Calgary last week with George Clark and his fifth wheel and his coup d'etat initiative? Is that on your radar? Uh, not much. Uh, you know, I heard it was going on but, uh, but I wasn't uh, uh, spending a lot of time uh, watching it, but you know, I think that uh, in any healthy democracy there needs to be an opportunity uh, for people who disagree with the government to express themselves. Sometimes they express themselves uh, to the government, sometimes they express themselves to other people in the province, sometimes they express themselves to the media. That's part of a healthy democracy and, and so um, it's, it, it's an evidence that uh, that continues here in Alberta. It's fair enough to state that Ezra Levant disagrees with you and, and Sheila Gunn-Reed and the rest of the Rebel Media. I can almost see a physical mm -hmm. response from you when I say that. <laughs> and I'll say yeah. that you and I have something in common, I think, in that I don't have much time for that, uh, what do we want to call it, an agency of commentary either. But your government certainly took some lumps 
in trying to, yeah. what was perceived as at least, silence rebel media. Does your government, do you think, have an optics problem? Yeah. No, I, I, I don't I think so, but I do believe, I mean, to be clear, I mean, we weren't ever suggesting we would silence rebel media. Rebel media will always do what rebel media does, and that's great. But there's no question that uh, uh, it was not a good decision to single them out for saying you can't have access to our to our um, press conferences. And so uh, we have now asked us a respected person in the media to come and give us some advice on how we deal going forward with uh, social media participants um, and, uh, and how we ensure that it's not us that's making a decision around this social media participant, that social media participant, and that you know 30-year journalist. Uh, that's not for us. I do agree, in fact, that it was not for us to make that distinction. Uh, we would like for some advice uh, on how to deal with it because it's a changing environment, as, as you know, um, in terms of uh, who uh, suggests that they are in the media and, uh, and starts um, asking to be treated um, in the same way that, that other um, more, um, uh, you know, Traditional. traditional media outlets are. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there's great uh, democracy that comes from new media. So we need to make sure that, that we can facilitate that. So that was not a decision uh, that at the end of the day I thought um, I needed to maintain. And I think that uh, we, we admitted that we made the wrong choice there and, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. You're obviously a seasoned politician. You've seen a lot down here at the Alberta Legislature, but no doubt the game is different when you're Premier. What's the personal impact of accusations that you're not looking out for Albertans or accusations that you don't care about the oil industry or that you're ignoring what people think? Well, you know, I think it's always been my view either when I was in a caucus that, that enjoyed 8% uh, of the popular vote or 9% of the popular vote, which I believe it did when I was first elected, to being in the government now, uh, that I work to do the job uh, that I uh, think is the best I can do, that represents the greatest number of people. Um, I'm driven by the goal of, of serving Albertans and ensuring that we, we um, uh, in our role of government, uh, are able to help and support them as best as we can. And as long as that continues to be what drives my decision making, then it continues to be rewarding. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time reading my own press because, quite frankly, I don't think that's helpful uh, to anybody, let alone um, a premier or a politician or a celebrity or anybody else. You need to do things on the basis of what you think are right, based on the values that you brought to, to the office. And uh, that's what I've been doing since I've been elected, even before I was premier. And that's what I'll continue to do. It was interesting uh, to see the formation of, uh, of the Economic Development Ministry headed up by Darren Billis. We had yeah. an opportunity to chat with him as soon as that announcement was made. Still waiting on details on what the NDP jobs creation mm -hmm. strategy will look like. Can, can you provide any for us now? Well, th there's more work being done, but of course uh, th there were some key pillars that we announced last, last fall. Uh, first of all, um, um, we, we significantly increase the capital investment uh, that we will um, make as a government in order to both uh, take advantage of the fact that prices are a little bit lower and also to provide some job transition for people who are otherwise looking for employment. And so that was the first piece, uh, and that was on the recommendations of uh, um, former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge. Um, the second thing that we did was we uh, freed up a, a lot of um, uh, financing opportunities for uh, not only business in general, but small and medium enterprises, and also for venture capital people. Because at this time of economic contraction, uh, business owners and, and job creators can find it harder to get access to that capital that would help them transition to the next phase of their business. So we opened up uh, over $2 billion uh, there last fall. Um, the third thing that, uh, of course, is just a uh, it, something to be considered in, in, as it relates to the alternative, in that we've adopted this approach that stability in public services and stability in public investment needs to be maintained right now. That we're not going to pile on to the, the um, uh, trials within our economy by pulling more money out 
and firing teachers and nurses and other public servants. So that stability of public management, while it's engaged with prudence, will, generally speaking, remain the same. Will we see a budget before the March 22nd by-election? Uh, we are wanting to see the outcome of the federal budget uh, before we lock down the final numbers on ours. And uh, as you would know, the uh, federal government just delayed their, their budget. So I suspect you'll see ours coming after that. Brian Jean, of course, put together this equalization fairness panel, and they'll be reporting back to the legislature by October 15th, leading up to a renegotiation slated for 2019. Are Albertans getting a fair shake when it comes to equalization? Well, I think that uh, um, equalization over time uh, has helped build our country, but there's no question that uh, right now, uh, you know, it's it's you know we don't we we would rather see uh, more money coming back to Alberta to support us. So, the the issue with the equalization formula is that there's such a delayed uh, implementation of it based on the the measures. Is that even if it changed tomorrow, we wouldn't see a change. Um, for, for a few years down the road. And so what we're saying to the federal government very emphatically is that we need help from you now. We need uh, changes to EI. We need uh, a major infrastructure investment uh, now and, and up front. And uh, we also uh, need you to move quickly on the issue of pipeline infrastructure, working with um, leaders in uh, other provinces and other civil society leaders, helping us to make the case of why this is important. Now, obviously, the federal government needs to let the NEB process run its course, and I agree with that because uh, politicizing the NEB process is not helpful. But what they can do is make sure that we have a beginning and a middle and an end to that process and that it does not go on indefinitely. Do you believe you have a receptive audience with the Prime Minister in, in lobbying for changes to the EI structure across Canada? Do you have a timeline in mind? Uh, I don't have a specific timeline, but I have made the case uh, very assertively uh, to the Prime Minister that, that we need those changes right now because families are hurting right now and uh, it can't wait for some larger review. It needs to happen right now and uh, and uh, I think he heard me because I kept saying it over and over and over. We flew from Edmonton to Calgary and, and uh, it, it came up a lot. <laughs> Finally, you, you recently added to your cabinet six new members, uh, including uh, Stephanie McLean as Minister of Service Alberta. Then yeah. she, of course, added to her own brood with the yes. arrival of, of her young son. Congratulations to the NDP family on that. We had a lively debate mm -hmm. uh, on my show about that. Okay. Many people, of course, supported the progressive nature mm -hmm. of these cabinet additions, but some questioned the timing, most specifically a cabinet minister just about to have a baby. What was the thinking there? Well, the thinking there is this, that sometimes women get pregnant, and one of the outcomes of that is that you deliver the baby. And neither pregnancy nor motherhood should impede somebody from getting a promotion that they deserve. And Stephanie McLean deserved that promotion, and I'm very pleased that she got it. Premier, thank you for your time. Thank you.